Hello. Welcome to Civil. <laughs> I've got to cut that piece off the end of that song. Um, welcome to Civilization Jihad Awareness, the show where truth wins every time. And where does that term civilization jihad comes from? It comes from the explanatory memorandum, which is a document discovered thanks to the actions of one great uh, Baltimore, uh, sorry, sorry, Maryland Transit Authority officer. And all he did was just uh, just do his job, and that led to allowed the I should say allowed to and allowed the police to do one thing, and that is to go to the house of 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 one man and. They had hidden Ismail Abreis off, and, and they had 93 bankers' boxes hidden in a dugout, hidden sub-basement. Um, and one of these documents that was in those boxes is called the Explanatory Memorandum. And I'm just going to read one paragraph from that to give you an idea what the Muslim Brotherhood has, why they use that term, civilization jihad. It comes from... Uh, the paragraph on understanding the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. It, it says uh, here, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Aquan must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying their work in America. Sorry, the Aquan must understand their, that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad and work wherever he is and wherever he lands until the final hour comes. And when there, and there is no escape from that destiny except for those who choose to slack. But with the slackers and Mujahideen be equal. Again, that's not something I wrote. It's something the Muslim Brotherhood wrote to describe their war against North America. Now today I have a, a guest that I have been long time hoping to connect with, and I have to tell you, I didn't realize all his. Uh, all of his bio, how how scholarly this, this person is, from reading just his, the book that he wrote called "A God Who Hates Woman." Um, I had no clue reading this book the, the connections that this man has. I, I have to recommend this book to everybody. Um, please do go to Amazon. Please do go purchase this book called "A God Who Hates Woman." It is a story that should be shared around the world. So let me tell you a little bit about the author, Dr. Majid Rafizada. Now, I'll say his bio is quite extensive, but I'm just going to read some of it from the Harvard, the scholar Harvard site. Um, as a businessman, public speaker, and world-renowned political scientist, Dr. Majid Rafizada has been recipient of multiple scholarships and awards, including from Oxford University, Annenberg and University of California, Santa Barbara. Frequently called upon to brief U.S. and EU officials, he has been invited to teach at universities, including University of California, Santa Barbara, through U.S. State Department Fulbright Teaching Scholarship, as well as testify as an expert at U.S. governmental organizations such as the U.S. Federal Court. He is also the president of the International American Council an author, and serves on the boards of several organizations, including the U.S. Middle East Chamber of Business and Commerce, Harvard International Review of, of, US, of USAID Center for Energy Studies, and member of the Gulf 2000 Middle East Project of the, of the Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. This goes on and on. He has been used... Um, by our federal government. He has been utilized by uh, major media networks, including uh, BBC, Bloomberg, LA Times, uh, CNN, uh, and even Fox, <laughs> among several, several others. Um, there's, there's, there's just so much that this, this gentleman has done. This young gentleman, I can call him younger. He's a little bit younger than me, not much. But, uh, I'm going to bring him on. Welcome, Dr. Rafi Sada. Welcome. Uh, hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, thanks for your kind words. I'm kind of flattered. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, I want to say also, I mean, you have done a lot, and I appreciate all your work. I want to apologize to the uh, to your audience because I'm now I had an emergency flight, so I'm in the airport, and if you hear noises, it's 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 just not my fault. It's the announcers <laughs> here that are just uh, announcing different kind of flights, and and so I apologize for that. But thank you, and I I'm very happy to to connect with you and to your uh, audience. I have to say, I, I guess I read this book in last summer, and it hit me so so hard that I started sharing it on the air here, and I started sharing it when I when I gave speeches because there are some things. I mean, I've actually stood in front of Antifa, read this, read some of your of the of the book, and they stopped screaming while I was doing that, and, and it was it was very very brief, you know, but. Some of the words just caught them, and they were there to protest the fact that um, I was I was with Gita Canada and speaking um, to get the to get the truth out about what was happening in Canada as far as freedom of speech. But I have yes. to say, this is a really powerful book. I'm just going to start right into the questions, um, Dr. Rafi. Your book, God Who Hates Woman, is powerful. I've told many it is a must read, but both because it's detailed account and because it is a story that reveals the cruelties under is allowed under Islam. Before we get into this, I think it's best if you set the scenario where this takes place and when. Well, thank you, Paul. Again, I want to appreciate really the, the, the awareness that you raise, and I really appreciate it that you have been speaking about the book. And, uh, and uh, I think it, it, uh, you're totally, uh, absolutely right. It's, it's a book that... Uh, shed light on cultural, religious, and political perspectives in the Middle East. And for many people who uh, who want to know more about Islam, I think it's a book that not me, many reviewers have said that it, uh, it, it draws a lot of an insight. And it's been, um, it's, been, uh, it's been in a lot of library, university, Ivy schools, uh, and Stanford University and other universities because it, 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 it gives some insight in, in, in the culture and religion of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the Middle East and Islam. And back to your question, uh, you know, the, the book uh, is, a, is a history of between 1970 to 2009. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it gives you kind of four decades of cultural and, uh, you know, sociopolitical and socio-religious uh, landscapes uh, of the region. So I start in the book with uh, where my mom uh, got married, uh, her first marriage, and it's in, in two countries, in Iran, and the book uh, talks about two countries, Iran and Syria, where I grew up uh, and I was raised. Uh, and th- these two countries are very important because they represent two branches of Islam, Sh- uh, Shia and, and Sunni, as you know, uh, these are two uh, dominant uh, 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 sects in the religion of Islam. Syria is majority Sunni, uh, and uh, Iran is majority uh, Shia. And Syria is, a, is an Arab country. Iran is a, they call them, they, they like to say they are Persian. So they are different ethnicities, different, uh, um, different sects of religion, but it gives you a good picture of uh, of uh, of uh, what's going on in the Middle East. I think that's real important uh, that you pointed out in the book too at certain points, but I think it's real important people understand that even today Iran still refers to itself pretty much as Persia and that is something that it's a concept that needs to be understood as well. And I, I don't yes, think we cover that. Great. Um, so I'm going to just head on. Uh, your book points out many cruelties to women under the Islamic culture. One of the first cruelties you mention is the cultural acceptance or normality of abusing women. I think this is something you wish to expose to the world in writing this. Am I right? Can you tell listeners about your mother's first husband and why she was smart to leave? Well, thank you. I think you you also I think touched on that uh, in your speakings. I think in how about women rights in the in the region. Uh, uh, before I answer that, I I want to point to the question that you just asked. You know about the Persian. Um, uh, yes, in Iran they're very proud to be to be Persian. So a lot of people in the West think that the the Middle East is a you know, 
monolithic uh, region, everybody is the same, but they, they have differences in ethnicities. Iranian like to say they're Persian. If you tell them you're Arab, they don't like it. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Arab also, they're proud uh, to have an Arabic uh, heritage. So there is this, uh, this uh, I think, uh, point to, to, to refer to. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, about women, I think uh, the book talks a lot about women rights. It, it wants to really advance women rights. And, uh, and I think uh, one point that you mentioned is about the uh, cultural acceptance of women uh, inferiority. And it's a very patriarchal society. So where, uh, uh, when uh, my mom was growing up, and even now, uh, there are a lot of uh, similarities that, uh, that uh, the culture accepted the idea that women are second-class citizens and uh, they should be treated as such. Uh, they are property of, uh, of, of men or of their brothers, of their husbands. As long as they're in the house, they're property of their uh, parents, their brothers, and when they go out, they're property of their husbands. So this is how girls um, have been raised uh, uh, in the region. This is from cultural perspective. But then again, you play the religion into it. The religion doesn't help here. Islam also provides the language to intensify subjugation of women. It gives you some, uh, you find in Quran, there are some... uh, some uh, surah or some, uh, you even uh, like prophet saying, hadith they call it, there are things that gives, uh, gives, uh, gives power more to the culture to subjugate women because they are not considered the same. For instance, they, they don't inherit uh, as much as the men inherit. Their, 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 uh, their evidence, testimony in the court is not as equal as men testimony in the court. So they are, from every perspective, from judiciary perspective, from cultural perspective, from political, they are hammered. And, uh, and that's what happens. And I think, uh, um, uh, did, you, did you all ask about uh, how uh, my mom uh, married to, uh, with her yeah. first husband? Yeah, could you tell yeah. a little bit about how, what, was, what was important, why she had to leave? Well, you know, it's, she, she was 16, uh, 15, 16, and uh, as the girls are, were considered, and still a lot of uh, areas are considered in the region as a burden, so the family tried to get rid of them as soon as possible. So when somebody comes and proposes to them, they will give it to the person, and the girl has no say. So what happens is that my mom was 16, and uh, this guy came, her first husband, he came and he proposed, uh, uh, he didn't even see her. He just came house, and his parents saw her, and she, he said, I want her, and my grandma and my grandfather and her bro- my mom brothers, they were, okay, so let's give it to him. Now, first, he lied about his age. He was uh, more than 15 years older. Uh, and the second thing um, is that my mom, uh, uh, well, they, she didn't have a word to say it, so she, she agreed to see him. When she saw him, she said, I don't want him. Uh, I, I don't like him, uh, and my grandmother and grandfather and my brothers, they were, they were like, uh, you know, she's, uh, he's, he's very religious, he's a very good person, he's a very good Muslim. So uh, what is a good Muslim? Is a, he, well, he's, he prays five times a day, he fasts, and that's what matters. So he's a very, very good person. Well, then they marry her to the, uh, they force her to marry the, him, and uh, the first night, what he did is that uh, he beat her up, and that's that's a kind of cultural thing. There's a saying that you know, uh, uh, it might be it might look like a violent saying, but there's a saying in Arab posture is that uh, uh, cut the throat of the cat at the day of the wedding. It means if you want your wife to uh, uh, to to obey you, you you shock her in the first night and you, you oppress her or it's called a shock and awe theory in political science. You shock her so she will be afraid for the rest of her life. So what he did, he beat her up first day uh, of the wedding and um, he forced her to, to have uh, sexual intercourse and uh, then, uh, then it continued and uh, it went on he would everything you find a problem with her, he would beat her up. Uh, uh, like for instance, if the food was not good enough, if he was five minutes late, or 
if if she went to the grocery and bought something which was a couple of I don't know uh, dollar more expensive than what he expected, uh, so he would beat her up, and she didn't have anyone to go to because the culture again or the religion says that you know the women have to be obedient to her husband. So if she goes to her family, she went to her sister, uh, but they couldn't. Re- they would tell her you know that's how it is. You have to just just tolerate it and you have to live that's what women men are men are supposed to be and it's like a norm men are supposed to beat up their wife and it's it's a norm and you have to to be a good wife and and just uh, satisfy him so she went on until she had uh, her first uh, child my half brother and uh, then one day he he got in he beat her up, and then he picked up the child who was like one years old, and he threw him to the wall. And that's when she decided that I'm not gonna leave here. So she took the child and went back to her family's home, to her grand, to her parents. And they told, she told them, you know, you wanna, you don't want me, it's okay. But this, ch- I'm not gonna go back because he's going to kill or, in, or, or or injure the child and and for my child I'm gonna leave him here and if you don't want me it's okay I'm if you do if you want to do whatever with me I'm fine but I'm not gonna go back because it's not about me this time it's about this child and that's where she kind of went against the culture and she went against the uh, cultural norm and the religion and and she stayed home and they they got divorced and what what does that mean to, in that culture to the family? I mean, the, has, has the woman then um, violated a culture norm? Has she she like uh, dishonored her family by walking out on a marriage? Oh yeah, that's that's a very good point that you're bringing up. Uh, all that's that's very important in that culture because in that culture, if you're a divorced woman, you have not only dishonored your family, you are disgraced for the for the society. Everybody asks you, uh, are you married, uh, and you say, no, I'm divorced, they don't want to talk to you. They, they, they kind of, you know, you, you are not a good woman. They don't ask what happened, how did you get divorced. Quickly they pass judgment that you are not a good wife and you left, uh, you left your, your husband. So it, it is a very taboo. It's a taboo in the society really to get, uh, to get divorced, and, and she had to deal with that after her divorce. Uh, she, uh, a lot of her friends wouldn't talk to her. Uh, she wasn't able to go a lot of places uh, because uh, they're considered. Also, there is like, something in the culture is considered. If a woman is divorced, she's easy. It means that you can you can access her easily, and that's 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 something which is which which made her more in prison because she couldn't go out. Uh, she had to be very careful not to dishonor her family more. Uh, so, but she agreed uh, to 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 be confined inside the house uh, with her child and to be to be with uh, with the uh, with her first husband. That's kind of I, I, it's kind of a hard thing to imagine. That's why I think this book is important because I, I guess some aspects of culture are so foreign, and unless we we look at it in a book like what you've what you shared with us uh it's it's so hard to believe i i know it i like to read and i can usually read a book quite fast but i had to keep putting mm-hmm. this down because of the, uh i had well, to stop and think <laughs> it's, well, it's hard. I, I have I mean, people yeah i have people tell me that you know we've been reading the book and honestly it's it's emotionally so like you know there's so much weight emotionally and there's so much uh, sadness going on about women, how they are tortured, that we couldn't really bear. We have to put it down, like what you said, and take it the next day and read it. And, uh, and, and you know, the one, one other point I want to tell Paul is about, uh, which is still important, is about virginity. So once you lose your virginity inside, that, inside the Muslim culture, you lost a very, very important asset. So you are not anymore, like, even if you had a little respect, you lose that respect. So the, the virginity is really very, very important. That's and Hello? now, now, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Yeah, I don't know where, where did I cut off? Uh, did I? Oh, you we were, you were the talking about, about the virginity, virginity and the import, the importance of it. Yes. Yes. So 
I was saying that is uh, it's kind of in the culture and still it is that if you lose your virginity, you have lost a very very important asset, and uh, and that's that's why why even if you had a little respect, you lose that respect. What is left? Uh, so uh, that's why now, like in Iran, like in countries like Iran now, what girls do, they they might have. Uh, premarital sex, but what they do is that there are many doctors now. They actually make them, they make surgery on them and make them back virgin. So when they get actually married, they look like they're virgin. So they'll so reattach the hymen. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and 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 this is really sad. I mean, why they have to go through this? Uh, that is so important. But again, as I said, it's because they are property of the family of the culture. And uh, and so there is a very heavy burden on them, really, to satisfy the culture, the religion, and the, uh, the family. This uh, this is just incredible. Um, one of the other, the next cruelties I noticed was this polygamy. Um, under Islam, it's legal. It it seems that under the culture, there's nothing that really protects the woman from being pulled into becoming a second wife. I, I I'm kind of surprised about that um, that there's nothing in Islam that would protect the woman to say, you know, when you go into, I mean, even governmentally I would think there would be something to say, look you're going to be the second wife, or you're going to be the third wife, or whatever that, that she should at least be informed on that but that's not a requirement No, you're, you're absolutely correct, and that's where, you know, Paul's religion plays their role, you know sometimes Religion can help and sometimes can actually worsen the issue. And here religion worsens the issue because what it says is that, you know, a man has the right to marry four wives and, ha- and, uh, and uh, uh, well, before he was have as much slave uh, girl as he wants. But uh, now it's marry four wives according to the, to the uh, Quran. So, and he does not have any obligation to tell his wife that he's going to marry another person. So uh, that gives really a lot of power to men. That gives a lot of power to the patriarchal system, and it subjugates and oppresses uh, women. And that's what happened, what happened to, to, to my mother in, in her second uh, marriage. Um, I don't know if you want me to, to talk about that. Oh, cool. Please do, please do. Yes, yeah, so in you know my second marriage, my my father came to Syria and he was uh, he he's from Iran. Uh, he came to Syria and he saw my mom and he 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 proposed. In his when he proposed, my mom didn't want to marry. She wanted just to be single and left alone for the rest of her life. And then he started uh, again. You know the same scenario. Her family wanted to get rid of her because she was a girl. She was a burden and. Uh, and she was uh, kind of, you know, dishonored, disgraced to the family. So they wanted to get rid of her. But he also, uh, they told him, are you married? He said, well, I have a wife who has a cancer and she's going to die. Well, he was lying. Uh, his, his wife was not going to die or anything, and she's still alive. Uh, and he didn't tell his first wife that he's going to marry my mom. Uh, so he he told uh, he told them that my he has five children from his first wife that uh, that need they need a mother. So my mom felt bad. She said, okay, his first wife is dying. And he has children who needs to be raised. So I'm gonna accept it because you know it's 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 just uh, it's just she can't you know leave the children alone and it's morally and ethically and religiously not good. Uh, so she was doing it for her God. And once she got married, she realized she went back, and that's where the surprise happened. She took her to Iran, and that's where he left her alone. And the first wife realized, and she realized, and and it was a whole a whole different issue. That's, but you know, that's uh, a, just uh, yeah. you, you you know the thing is that like what you said. I just want to refer to what you said that you know it's not illegal. If it was illegal, if it was a legal system that would prevent that, they, he would have to be held accountable and responsible. But there is, the legal system is with him. So it supports him. The judicially religious system 
the Islamic system supports him. So they couldn't do anything. So he was the, the he was the winner here. One of the passages that surprised me a little was how different Syrians' women's customs were from Iranian women's customs. Um, in the passage, your mother, there's one passage where your mother's pregnant, she's hot, she's still dressed, but not in a hijab or one of these heavy burqas. In her, in her house, and all of a sudden, three men are there who become accusers and claim she was naked. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Come on, the woman's dressed. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's in her place. I know, you know. <laughs> I know. It's kind of unbelievable. When you tell people uh, here, they can't believe it. I mean, she was dressed. She only didn't have her scarf. So her hair was, uh, you know, exposed. And they were the ones who walked in the house without knocking. And then they, in the family, they started telling my father that, you know, your wife was naked on purpose or whatever. She wasn't wearing her scarf appropriately. And that was inside her house. She wasn't even outside. Uh, I mean, you know, inside you're allowed to take off your scarf. And, but anyway, so because there is, you know, back to the issue of honor. Uh, for my father felt like, you know, he was dishonored. So it was a pretty dramatic situation. He, he, he throw all her um, uh, uh, private clothes from the window to the streets uh, to humiliate her. Uh, people were walking by and looking, and he poured uh, gasoline on her. Uh, and he was going to find a match to light her up, to to just to burn her. And then he, his sister-in-law started going after him and swearing him, please don't don't do that. For God's sake, don't don't burn her. She's she's a foreigner. She's not from this country. Uh, why are you doing this? And then he he didn't he didn't burn her. But my mom was like she was telling me that she was. Uh, my mom, you know, by the way, she never told these stories to us. I mean, it was when I wanted to write the book, she was she 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 was hesitant. I mean, she she was crying when she was telling. She said, I don't want to really upset you guys, or I don't want to say anything. Uh, but she, you know, and then I verified it. I talked to people and everybody was like, yeah, this happened. And, uh, and then, uh, and then it was, uh, it, you know, it was, it was co- complete uh, kind of humiliation. And she, she was left alone. Again, the, you know, the women don't have, the problem is that the system does not give them power. So they don't, can't go to the court. They don't have uh, anybody to go to. If they go back to their family, the family not going to support them. Uh, the uh, the culture, the religion, everybody is against them. So it's they're really in a very very difficult situation, and I'm sure this has happened to a lot of women. It's not just my uh, my my mother, but again, I was giving an example. I think that's that's one of my next questions is about the amount of uh, alone time. Um, the husband, it seems, can just pick up and say, "I'm going to." to Syria, I'm going to Iran, I'm going to wherever and I mean it doesn't have to be a discussion and he can be gone for a month or two and not financially I mean it seems like he doesn't have to financially provide for her or or, or keep in touch with her I, I mean, here in the United mm-hmm. States we would call that neglect <laughs> um, I, I, this is one of the things that's hard for me to understand um, I'm sure some uh, the women out there who are listening ca- can't even imagine your husband leaving you for a month or two, and you know you don't know when he's coming back. <laughs> that is, yeah, you're, you're you're absolutely correct. I mean, she was left uh, when she was uh, um, pregnant with me. I mean, she would left he left her without food, without anything, and in a foreign country, and he would go live with his first wife. I mean, for a month, and then uh, she was terrified. I mean, uh, and uh, and uh, but again, you know. You know that's that's the patriarchal society, uh, which allows it. And uh, again, the religion gives a language to support this. And so there was nothing uh, uh, they 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 can do. They can't really sue him. They can't do anything. So that that's what it is. It's it's just a, I think that's one of the, the thing that really hit me in here is how the alone time, um, not knowing if your father was coming back, or not knowing if he was alive. Um, there is one time in here um, that the book talks about the I believe the Iranian Revolution happening, 
and your father yeah. comes in and is a little bit. I, I, this is the part that that also is inter- should be interesting to a lot of people. He comes in and he's uh, talked to to the guard by by the Iranian, I believe, Revolutionary Guard uh, people serving on the border, and they have a problem with yeah. his mother because she's not from Iran. And you want to tell them a little bit about that story? Yeah, so he went after they got uh, they got married. So he took her to the uh, to Iran. Uh, and the fun, the funny thing is that they did not know anything about him. My 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 mother's parents. So they just gave him this girl without knowing anything about him. So he took her to another country, and then in the on the border, it was just the revolution has happened and. Uh, the, the Islamic Republic was in power and the revolutionary guards started questioning him. And my mom, well, you know, in the, in the Syrian culture, women, uh, they were scarred, but they, they were also skirts and they were like shirts or they were like pants, you know. But in Iran, it's more, um, the hijab was more like a covering. So you have to really, you can't wear pants, you can't wear shirts and uh, scarf. You have to actually cover uh, your body with something that doesn't show the features of your body. Uh, so she wasn't wearing that. So they started asking her, asking him, who is she? And they started questioning him. And then he got, he got upset. And he was like, what's your business? Because he, you know, he was in, in uh, pre-revolution time, which was okay, everything. But now, uh, so he started uh, to resisting them and telling, what, what, what is your business with my wife? And then they they beat him up. They took him to the to the to the detention and prison, and they beat him up, and they left her alone. So she had to to stay one night uh, looking for him. She didn't know what's going to happen in a different country. She didn't speak the language at all. And remember, this is a time that we don't have cell phones, and we don't have uh, you know internet to call his family. In. So she, so they 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 were they were pretty. Uh, uh, angry because they didn't know who is this woman. She was not registered as married to him in Iran. She was in Syria, but not in Iran. So they thought, you, we don't recognize you as married. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's what what happened at that time. And it was pretty first, I think, uh, shocking moment when she went to Iran. I think your mother is is an incredible person. I mean, after the beatings, after every, after all the, how the way she's been treated, when he comes back, he's 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 been beaten. And what does she do? She takes care of him. It's just, to me, it's just amazing the the amount of loving care she gives him at that moment. Um, well, I, I would tell her that that you said that <laughs> she would be very. Happy, you know, you know, that's that's how she, you know, she was, uh, she believed it. I mean, she doesn't believe in complaining. She just, she just said, you know, whatever God, she believes in faith, and she said, you know, God wants this for me. I can't do anything about it, and uh, she just tried to be to be nice to 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 people, and uh, and and that was the first reason she married him because she wanted to take care of his children. It's it's uh, quite a statement. I um. I have to say I'm I'm really impressed with uh this book. I have to say um I have I've given you a lot a, a lot of time to share. Uh, is what would you I've asked pointed questions. Um what would you like to tell our listeners about this God who hates women? Well, you know, I would like to tell them that you know uh this book really provides a great insight, not based on what I'm saying, based on a lot of reviewers and good people like you about religion, about culture, and how patriarchal societies uh, in a Muslim-majority countries are suppressing women. It's about women's rights. It's about if they want to learn about Islam, if they want to learn about uh, women, culture, men in that region, uh, this is a first-hand experience. It's not just based on uh, reading other books I have written. This is a very, and a, and a, and a, and a, you know, life story, and uh, it. I think it will provide with provide them with a really great insight if they want to learn more about uh, uh, about that part of the world. And even here, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, Muslims in the West, uh, and they still practice the same culture. 
uh, as they as as people in the Middle East. So I think if they want to learn more, this will provide uh, an insight for them. I didn't write the book for money. I didn't write it for anything because I didn't need it. I just wrote it because I thought, you know, this is a story that can uh, can give uh, can raise awareness and uh, and hopefully uh, help some uh, some women in the region. Now, I have a question from one of our listeners. I, I think it's probably one of the best ones I should have asked earlier. Um, how do you feel about these postmodern feminists not protesting the Iranian? I mean, they're out there. I'm sorry. How these postmodern feminists not protesting or supporting the Iranian women, protesting with the Iranian women who are uh, who are protesting the hijab? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I think they're actually doing a really really bad job for people there. They're actually contributing in suppressing women more. I see a lot of them here in the West, and I have written an article called uh, the, 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 the Moderate Muslim Industry uh, on Gatestone uh, in the West. So these moderates have never lived in the region. Uh, the so-called moderate Muslim scholars or industry, they have never really experienced any. They have been living in any oppression. They have been living in a West where there's a free, uh, you know, uh, freedom of speech. There is a democracy so they can say whatever they want. But unfortunately, they're trying to, they don't, they don't um, uh, draw attention on what's going on in the region. Uh, they only criticize the West. Uh, they don't draw attention on, uh, on women in the region, on how gays are being, or uh, lesbians, or I don't know, a lot of women have been uh, persecuted and oppressed. Uh, they don't want to talk about that. And I think the language they're using, and I, I really encourage people to read my article because I have, I have written, I mean, elaborately on different points, uh, that how, how they are actually contributing more to the suppression of people in the region. Um, I'm going to ask my friend Kel here if she could find that Gatestone article for me and put it in the chat room. Um, and what was it called again? Uh, the, the Moderate uh, Muslim Industry. Okay. Industry, Kel, could you put that Muslim in the industry. chat room, please? Um, and we'll definitely get that shared out. Um, wow. And you know, there is, a, there, is another, there is another article they might uh, like. Uh, it's called, uh, I wrote it, uh, which was one of the most uh, read popular articles. It was called, uh, uh, as a Muslim, uh, I'm shocked with liberals. Uh, so I think that's, <laughs> oh. that's another one. <laughs> yeah. That, I'll get that so one that's out That's another there. article. Yeah, it's, if you Google it, I think you will come up uh, on Google, uh, on Gatestone. Is that also. with Gatestone also? So, uh, I, I love Gatestone. Yeah. I'm always sharing their work. I'm always, uh, every, what was, see, like, the way I do my show is when I'm done with the interview, I share news for the week. And this is probably the only week I haven't got a lot of Gatestone articles. But every week I've got something from Gatestone uh, that I share out because they put out some some of the best quality stuff that's out there. Uh, I did I did not realize you wrote for, for them. I'm, I'm just amazed. Um, Thank you. Tell people so so they can find you on Gatestone. Um, I unfortunately, yes, we're running somewhat out of time. Um, can you tell people how they can follow you and and see what to follow your work and how to so, get a hold of your book? Yeah, the, books. The best way, <laughs> it, yeah, the the books uh, they can go on Amazon. Uh, just on Amazon and uh, put my name. The, all the books will come up. Uh, and uh, for articles. They can go to my Gatestone profile, so I write articles there uh, uh, periodically, and you can, they can find those, and I have written a lot, so um, that would be good for articles. I write for other places, but I think this is this uh, one place is they can, they can uh, go to, I think. Uh, so Gatestone profile, my profile there, and then uh, they also, um, my, my Twitter account, uh, Dr. Uh, underline Rafizade. Uh, that's my uh, uh, Twitter account. So I think these uh, three platforms should be enough. Well, thank you. I have to. Say, we'll have to see if we can get you back on in the future. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed with what you have shared, and I think it's all important. Please continue your work with Gatestone, and of Harvard of all places. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. I didn't know they they well, liked the. Want... 
people who would tell the truth sometimes. I don't know. That surprises me. <laughs> yeah, I know. A lot of people get surprised. But, you know, uh, we got to do what we got to do. And, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people do criticize. A lot of people do attack, and uh, they try to get me fired from places. Uh, and you know, uh, but I just continue doing it because I believe this is the truth, and I'm not going to compromise uh, my uh, my integrity for for you know being uh, you know for money or for other stuff that uh, uh, mainstream media here offers. And uh, because it has, it could be much easier for me to just be like the left, you know, the mainstream liberal media and just follow up with them and I will be promoted quickly and get a lot of good position. But I don't want to do that because I, I, I will be really doing damage to people in the region and uh, people like me. And what it comes down to is we have to get the truth out regardless of what people want us to say. <laughs> that's, yeah, exactly. That's what I think it is. What? Well, you know, and I, I want to say you, you, you Paul, doing a really great job. I mean, you're giving voice to people, and I really appreciate that. So uh, good luck with really everything you're doing, and just keep up the great work. Okay. Well, God bless. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'm going to see if I can send you one of my books uh, to your Harvard location. Sure. Because uh, I'd love to see what your thoughts are on my last one. <laughs> okay. God bless, and sure, thank you sure. for joining I would love us. That. Thank you, Paulie. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and take care. Goodbye, everyone. Take care.